All right, so Zephaniah chapter 1, and we pretty much made it through all of chapter 1. We kind of stopped at uh, the end of verse 15 there into 16, and I'm going to do something a little different this week. Um, We don't get to do this at a normal uh, service time, so I'm going to pass these out. And if anyone has a question, I'm going to kind of put one near the front here. You just flip this little, see, okay? Um, We do that so that we can get it on live stream. And if you see anybody, just kind of pass it to them. I'm going to stop as opposed to at the end of the message periodically throughout it. Maybe only once, maybe twice. But I want to give you the opportunity to ask Uh, questions if you have them. I'm not going to be offended um, if you don't have any questions, so don't feel like, uh, gee whiz, i got to come up with a question here so this guy, you know, doesn't feel like he's wasting his time on me. Um, uh, That's not going to offend me at all. So Zephaniah chapter 1, and we're going to back up to verse 14, and bring it forward. Again, uh, Zephaniah prophesied in the days of one of, if uh, not the best kings that reigned over Judah, King Josiah, who would begin reigning at eight years old during his time and bring uh, the most radical reforms to Judah, the uh, southern kingdom of Israel, um, of any king prior to him or after him. And it would only be a generation uh, that would go by, basically, um, before the Babylonian Empire would come in, destroy Jerusalem, burn down the temple, and take God's people captive. And that uh, historical event that took place for them was the day of the Lord, but it's also a type of the coming day of the Lord. And we're to read about it and understand that it works as a template for us to be able to read the things that we do about the end of days and what's going to happen when this world system collapses and Christ returns to rule over planet earth. It's meant to be a template to help us understand the ultimate day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath that's still to come. So Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and it hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble, a day of distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds, thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. And we closed with these set of verses last week and read through Amos chapter 5, which there um, is a correction to the people's thinking. The people had this perspective, regardless of whether they really had a relationship with God simply because they identified as God's people that the day of the Lord for them was going to be wonderful, that it was something that they should all be looking forward to simply because they identified as Israelites, as Jews, who of course are God's people. And in Amos chapter 5, he would tell them, woe to you that look forward to the day of the Lord. And then he would begin to describe what, what it would actually be like for those that were not really walking with the Lord, who nevertheless identified as his people. He said that in fact they didn't have anything to look forward to except for judgment. That it would be as a man who leaned his hand upon a wall to finally have a little rest, only to get bit by a serpent. And unfortunately, um, nothing has changed. There are masses who identify today as God's people, masses who identify as Christians who are yet to really be born again. They've not come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. They've not surrendered their lives to Him. 
And so they don't know what it is to have His Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them and to be walking with Him and to have a relationship with Him. And yet, they will fill churches this morning and they'll sing songs and they'll participate in things like prayer. And when things like the rapture are spoken of or the eternal bliss of heaven, they'll say amen and they'll take some type of comfort and yet many of them will never experience it but instead they will experience the wrath of God for eternity in hell. And there's no escaping that reality. And this dilemma is why God has sent prophets to His people all throughout history. And it's why pastors are called to preach the Word of God. As Paul said to Timothy, preach the Word. He didn't say talk about the Word, dance around the edges of it, mention some biblical themes, themes as you tell good stories and and jokes and and make people feel good we ought to feel good as we sit under the word of god and hear the promises of god and receive comfort from the holy spirit but that's not the job of the pastor or the one who preaches or even a christian who shares the word of god with lost people our job is to preach the word to be faithful to what god is actually saying in the scripture and it's because there's a great dilemma even among God's people where many of us have a false sense of security and that needs to be disrupted and taken away from us and the only thing that can do it is the clear teaching of God's word the Bible so the day of the Lord is um, a warning that Zephaniah is giving to the people of Judah. And there's a couple of things I, I want us just to kind of zone in on in these verses. We didn't have time to really zone in on last week. But notice how the whole description is gloomy. I mean, the whole thing is gloom and doom. I mentioned that last week. That whole idea of gloom and doom preaching is so often criticized, and yet it does come to us directly from the Scriptures. There's just no getting around that. And that doesn't mean that there isn't also comfort and just elation and joy and just wonder in the Scriptures there is. But this is something that's there. But look at verse 16. He says it's a day of trumpet, which I think that's interesting because you go through the revelation, what do, what do you find there? Trumpets all over the place. Right from chapter 1, I heard a voice behind me that sounded as if it were a trumpet. And then I turned to look and then unfolds this vision of Christ where John falls at his feet as if he were dead. Revelation chapter 4, he hears the same voice that sounded as if it were a trumpet. A few chapters later, there's seven messengers or angels introduced who have seven trumpets that blow throughout the Revelation. The Apostle Paul talked about that, 1 Corinthians 15, when he spoke about the rapture, the deliverance of God's people from the day of God's wrath. He said that a trumpet would sound. Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 24. So he says it's a day of trumpet, but look at this, alarm. A day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. Now, if you have a version other than King James or New King James, instead of high towers, you'll read something like lofty battlements. The ESV says lofty in place of high and battlements in place of towers. The imagery in the language there is meant to convey the idea of cities where they dwell in basic peace and safety. They're fortified. They feel like they're okay. They feel like they're okay because the perspective is there's relative peace in this day. In fact, Judah, near to the time when Babylon would come and destroy them, uh, had reached out to Egypt. And that's a picture of how God's people reach out to the world. Egypt represents the world in the Scripture. And they felt this relative sense of peace because of it. They thought, you know what? We have Egypt. Their armies are on our loan. We've got a pre pretty good army ourselves. We're pretty well fortified. I, I think we'll do okay. 
God's always delivered us in the past. I think we'll just be okay. And they had this false sense of security. That's going to be a big thing in these last days. Turn with me real quick into the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians, and if you can, keep your finger there in Zephaniah. But turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to read to you what the Apostle Paul has learned from Jesus that things will be like before this day of the Lord comes with all of its destroying force. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now this would be the point as we work through 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and we turn back into Zephaniah to cover the few verses ahead that if you have a question, because this could be new material for you, stuff you've never heard about before, some of it's a little hard to understand, so you feel free to raise your hand. We'll get you one of those mics and you ask. No reason to be embarrassed. The only reason, again, we're on the mic is for the sake of the recording. People can get your question and, and be able to learn as a result of it. So First Thessalonians 5, verse 1. Paul says, But concerning the times and seasons, because he's been talking about the coming of Jesus Christ, and in particular the day of the Lord. Concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly or full well, or you, you know completely that the day of the Lord, this is what Zephaniah is talking about, the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. We've heard that language before. For when they say... Peace and safety. Two things. world's going okay. I know there's skirmishes over there in the Middle East and different places like that, but we're doing pretty good. And safety. And even if somebody did come against us, I mean, look at our military. We are so well fortified. We are so well defense who's really going to mess with us i mean do you realize the kind of arsenal that we have when they say peace and safety then sudden destruction comes upon them that means in a moment in which they're not expecting it the day of the lord comes upon them this time breaks forth in a generation and in a time when they're not thinking that there's any reason to be afraid, to be concerned. And suddenly, Paul says, destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. Now it's interesting that he would use that analogy because usually pregnant women realize they're pregnant, don't they? I mean, mo most women that are pregnant, they know they're pregnant. But there still is that phenomenon where other than some Braxton Hicks or, you know, something like that and all the normal things that come along with pregnancy, you could just be sitting anywhere. You could be out in an Applebee's taking down some chips and salsa with a pickle on top and some ice cream or whatever you're doing as a pregnant woman. Just a normal Sunday after church. And you know you're pregnant, but you're just having lunch. And then your water breaks. And the moment's upon you. And things begin. And now you have contractions. And before you know it, you're having a baby. And Paul describes it like that because of the quickness with which it will come. So they don't expect it. They're saying peace and safety, but they ought not to be saying that. The reason they're saying that is because they've adapted to worldly perspectives. They've ignored the warnings of Scripture. Unfortunately, even some of the people that identify as the people of God, Judah would do the same thing we see in Zephaniah. And the people of God in, in our time will do much the same thing. Jesus told us that. In Matthew chapter 25, He gives a parable of servants and how they will be in the days 
uh, when he comes. And he says, and if that evil servant says in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, and he begins to eat and drink and get drunk with these other servants and just kind of flake off and forget that his Lord promised he would be returning he says he'll cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. And Jesus gives that parable of a group of servants where one of them would just begin to think in his heart, you know what, he's never really coming back. I mean, how long has this gone on? Peter tells us the same thing. How there'll be scoffers in the last days and they'll say, you guys have been saying that forever. There was this one weirdo, you remember, Harold Campin, and he said Jesus was coming at this time, and he had all these people ready, and he didn't come. And then there was this other guy, and you guys keep on saying Jesus is coming, and the wrath of God's going to come, and it ain't always going to go on like this, and it just keeps on going on like this. And Peter says that they're willfully ignorant. That's the term that he uses. They're willfully ignorant, meaning there's a witness inside of them. There's a witness inside of people that, number one, there is a God who created them and there's a God who created the earth and that he is a righteous God. People understand more within their hearts than we give them credit for. People know that if there were no laws, anarchy would break out. And they're grateful for law every time they're in a situation where maybe they get a little scared or the law will work to their benefit in some way. They only don't like it when it's time to work against them, like tax time or speed limit time. Or... But people have the revelation of God in their hearts. And Peter says they're willfully ignorant of the fact that this world's already been destroyed before. In fact, you know what? Even if you're an atheist and you believe in the silliness of evolution you still believe in things like an ice age and the absolute annihilation of dinosaurs. So even though you have origins and everything else when it comes to development of species completely wrong, you still believe a whole bunch of stuff got destroyed way back when. You still believe that. Why would you then not believe the potential that this could happen again in your lifetime? And most of them would say, well, we do believe that someday, you know, the sun's going to burn us up or we're going to fling off into space or, or whatever. But everybody then says, but not in my lifetime. When they say peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction upon them. Keep a finger there because we're going to go back there, but go back to Zephaniah, our text. And we went again to 1 Thessalonians 5 because he's saying that the day of the Lord is going to come in an alarming way upon fortified cities with high towers, lofty battlements. Verse 17, listen to this, I will bring distress upon mankind and they shall walk like blind men. Some of the version says they'll grope like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like refuse. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land, and the proper translation there, if you're reading any other version, is the whole earth shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he will make a speedy riddance of all who dwell in the land, or in ASB, ESV, NIV, all who dwell in the earth. But why are they going to grope around like blind men? You see, there's a judgment that is already upon people right now, today. There's a form of God's wrath that's being poured out, and it's been being poured out throughout all generations upon the people to whom, for instance, the prophet Isaiah said, in seeing, you will not see. 
in hearing you will not understand lest you should see with your eyes hear with your ears perceive with your heart and be converted and God would go on through Isaiah to talk about how that blindness was a stupor that came upon them from the Lord why would the Lord cause someone to actually deafen themselves to his word blind their spiritual eyesight because of continual rejection Even the book of Proverbs says, He that often hardens himself, being rebuked, shall soon be destroyed, and that without remedy. Eventually, as with Pharaoh, when the law of God has come to us there, the law of God came to him in the form of Moses five times and warned him, Let my people go. Do the right thing, Pharaoh. Soften your heart. But a man just hardens it woman hardens it over and over again eventually what happens with them is what happens with pharaoh the last five times it says and god hardened pharaoh's heart and god is going to blind people and god is going to actually harden people's heart in fact god is going to actually send a strong delusion upon people who have said no for the last time so that they will not even have a chance to believe some have wrongly said as long as you're still drawing a breath there's hope that's not true for everyone there are some people that are alive that are walking and that are breathing in this world that are already eternally condemned i hate to have to say that but that's absolutely true it's why when we approach people they need to be shaken to the core with the gospel now i want to show you that in scripture because i want you to know that that is based on the authority of god's word that's not just my opinion but the reason why they're groping around so many of them in blindness in this day when the wrath of God finally comes is because they waited too long they waited too long in Romans chapter 2 says that chapter 1 and chapter 2 it says the wrath of God has been revealed against mankind and then Paul goes on to talk about how they're suppressing the truth He says that what may be known about God was shown to them. That He revealed His attributes to them through creation, through conscience. And then comes in the Gospel. The only hope left for them who are suppressing the truth. It's the only hope of mankind. But God says it's a form of wrath. When they get to this point that Paul calls being given over to a reprobate mind. That reprobate mind simply means that their mind is fixed upon rejecting God, that it's fixed in rebellion, that it's fixed in living their own way, that they will be king and die as king, and they have become reprobate as Pharaoh was to the point where God says, I give you over to that mindset. And it says, because they did not find it convenient to retain God in their knowledge, he gave them over to all sorts of immorality, and he gives us a big list there. But look with me, as we think about the idea of people that are just in this spiritual blindness when the day of the Lord comes at 2 Thessalonians now, not 1, but 2 Thessalonians, one book past where we just were in the New Testament, And look at what the Apostle Paul says in chapter 2. They're going to grope about in blindness, Zephaniah says, and they are going to be destroyed. There's a certainty of, of their doom. And that's why there needs to be an urgency in us sharing with people, just like there was an urgency in God's prophets. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, right from verse... um, Right from verse 1. Now, brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
It's okay, the microphone, raise your hand, get it. I'm going to say some things that are going to probably be a little controversial to you, not for the sake of controversialness, not saying anything to you for shock value. That is an immature waste of time. I just want to teach you what the Scripture actually says. And then you can wrestle with it. And part of wrestling with it is asking questions and then going home and meditating on that. Now, brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or word or by letter, as if it were from us, because people were circulating false letters all the time in the names of apostles saying silly things. They were counterfeit. As if from us, as though the day of the Lord had come. New King James Version, the day of Christ, other versions, the day of the Lord had come. Some people were writing that. We're in our main services at 1030, 2 Timothy chapter 2. As we work our way through 2 Timothy, we'll see that there was guys in Paul's time even teaching the resurrection was already past. And the devil's motive in moving them to teach these silly things were to mess their faith up, to overthrow their faith. So Paul says, hey, don't pay attention to letters that are saying the day of the Lord has already come. It hasn't come. Verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means. I don't care if they pull out all the stops, do some kind of fake miracle. I mean, they really come off as credible. The day of the Lord has not come. And he's going to say to them, I'm going to give you something to look for that's coming before the day of the Lord. And until this comes, it doesn't matter what they say to you, don't believe them because they're deceiving you. Paul's going to be really clear about this, and I just want you to be able to hear what he says as he says it. Let no one deceive you, verse 3, by any means, for that day will not come unless... The falling away come first. Number one, what is the falling away? If you read through all Paul's writings and you read through Jesus' um, uh, prophetic messages in like Matthew chapter 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, all the same uh, message that he spoke to his disciples on the Mount of Olives about signs that would occur before his coming, here's what you get that Christians are going to fall away from the fundamentals of the faith. They're going to begin to fall away from the truth of the Bible. He warns Timothy. He says, Timothy, man, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season for the time will come when people won't endure sound teaching, but they'll heap to themselves teachers because of their itching ears. Just desiring to hear what they want to hear. He tells him in another place, he says, Timothy, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. They'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Jesus says, Matthew 24, guys, the time will come when the love and the word love in Matthew 24 in this verse is agape. When the love of many shall grow cold. The agape of many will grow cold and many will betray and hate one another. And Paul here warns us of this same thing. That there will be prior to the day of the Lord, the wrath of God coming upon the earth, a falling away from the truth. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and then something else. And the, the, the man of sin is revealed. You can see him. He's out in the open. The man of sin is revealed, whom we call the Antichrist. The son of perdition, referred to only uh, as one other person, Judas. What was Judas. He was a Christian that wasn't really a Christian. He was a follower of Christ that proved later not to be legitimate. And he had everybody fooled, didn't he? The Antichrist, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, 
so that he senses God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Don't you remember that when I was still with you, Paul was actually there among the Thessalonians teaching them prior to this? When I was with you, that I told you these things, verse 6, and now you know what's restraining. Restraining what? That the day of the Lord would come. That this falling away and this antichrist that would precede the day of God's wrath being poured upon mankind that would restrain that from coming. He tells him, he says, you know, you guys know, when I was with you, I spent time teaching you, and you know what's restraining. I, I would say most of us, a lot of us, are, are, are ignorant about that unnecessarily. We don't have to be. Every single one of us should leave here today knowing what is preventing the day of the Lord from coming. Because the Bible says it all over the place. Peter says it this way, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The long-suffering mercies of God are what are restraining. And all that belongs to that. Angelic forces uh, being dispatched under His sovereign command in the earth, doing all kinds of things we know very little about, and all of that invisible God stuff. But what we know ultimately, it is the working of God in the earth that is restraining this day because He wants people to be saved. You know what is restraining or withholding that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This is the man of lawlessness. And he's saying this mystery of lawlessness or this um, you know, secret of how uh, people are going to fall away into lawlessness. You remember Matthew chapter 7. There were people who Jesus said would come to him in the last day and they would say, Lord, Lord. And he would, he would ultimately tell them, I never knew you, but they would say to him, Lord, Lord, uh, have we not prophesied in your name, done uh, miracles, cast out demons? And he would say, depart from me, you lawless ones. I never knew you. There is a mystery of lawlessness that affects not the planet. The planet's always been in rebellion against God, but it affects the people of God, those who identify as Christians. Back in Zephaniah, we're reading about God prophesying to Jews, people who identified in that time as the people of God. And this mystery of lawlessness is, gee, how could some fake invade the churches, a bunch of false teachers and deceivers, and us believe it? Because you look in the book of Acts and they're strong and they're preaching the gospel and the power of God is there and people are being saved. But the apostles are warning, hey, there's a day coming. Acts chapter 20. They'll, some men, even of your own selves, rise up among you speaking perverse things to draw disciples away after themselves. Paul says, I cease not to warn you with tears for three years, day and night. Now you men, he says to the elders, shepherd the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. Why? Because grievous wolves are coming in, he says, who will not spare the flock. And we've seen it building and building and building and building, where today, man, unless you're a faithful teacher of God's Word, unless you're someone who loves the Lord, and you've studied the Word, to show yourself approved to God so that you can be a workman with the Scripture who doesn't need to be ashamed one day when you stand before the Lord. And so you're able to share with people. You know, without somebody like that, so much of Christianity today is, is just a bunch of hot air. It's just, it's just psychology or some other kind of self-help program with the right characters, Jesus and the Apostles. But the, the power of it, the meat of it, the reality, the truth of God's message is so often, it's not, it's not there. The mystery of, of this lawlessness, how it would invade and produce this falling away, Paul says it was already at work in his time. Back to verse 7. 
Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And people have tried to guess at that. Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it that, that, that's an inconvenient line of questioning because the Bible already give, gives us that answer. Okay? When, when you go back and you look at Daniel, Daniel is that book that's meant to peel back the covers off of the spiritual world and allow us to peer in and see heavenly battle taking place, which Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 goes on all the time. And there, what we see is Michael the archangel battling the demonic prince of Persia and Media. And we hear of Gabriel telling Daniel about these battles and, and telling him about how the Ancient of Days is going to uh, come and he's going to sit upon his throne and he's going to give the scepter and give the reward and give the, the kingdom to this conqueror, this king who is... Jesus, but there's this great picture, and this statement just grabs all of that theology and tells us that, man, God has a restraining force, and it's not an it, it's a, it's a he. Now, is it Michael the archangel? Is it, is it Jesus? I don't know that any of that is necessary to figure out. I know that the commander of the armies of the Lord showed up to Joshua, Remember? He was standing in front of him with a sword, and Joshua said, Are you for us or the bad guys? And he said, No, I'm the commander of the armies of the Lord. I'm not for either one of you. You get on my wagon, not me get on your wagon. So suffice it to say, the commander of the armies of the Lord, the one whom God has put in that place to keep this from abounding to the point where the Antichrist steps on the scene and this even greater mass number of believers just get taken hook, line, and sinker with deception, he is restraining. And then verse 8, Then the lawless one will be revealed who the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the power of Satan, working of Satan with all power, signs, Lying wonders with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Now pay attention here because remember the ideas in the day of the Lord? They're groping around like they're blind. And their destruction is certain. How did they get like that? This is how. Those who perish, all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth. Zephaniah came and Jeremiah came and Ezekiel came and Isaiah came and Zechariah came and all the prophets and every generation came. And for as many as who continued to reject them, reject them, reject them, ultimately the day of the Lord at the hand of the Babylonians will come and it will come ultimately again in the future, the ultimate day of the Lord. And for those who do not receive the love of the truth, Meaning they never determine they're going to embrace the truth and love it and choose the truth of God over the lies of the world. They make their deception certain because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And listen to this, 2 Thessalonians 2.11, For this reason, God will send them strong delusion so that they should believe the lie. So that they all might be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What is the lie? It's the same lie that the enemy has told from the very beginning. He, he, he told the same lie in the garden. You can frame it in different ways, but the way that he said it there was, oh, God just knows that when you partake, you, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to have this really wonderful experience. He's trying to hold you back from something good. But guess what? You can live in the garden, and you can eat of the tree. You'll be totally fine. You can stay here. You can enjoy all of this. And unlike God said, you can have this too. 
You can have this, you can have the world and the experiences and embrace this all and you can still have the garden. That's false Christianity. It always has been and it's the same today. It's that you can live for yourself and do it all your way and tack Jesus onto it and you still get eternity with Christ and you had the best of the world and living for yourself and you being on the throne and that's a lie and it's the one that the new Christian church is going to be selling to everybody. Have your best life now. Make every day Friday. Those are two of Joel Olstein's books. He's a false teacher. I don't say it because I don't like him. I actually like him. He's a neat-sounding guy. He's got a real cool smile. I like his accent. I'd love to have a cup of coffee with him, uh, but I'd also love to gently rebuke him because he's lying to millions of people all the time. And he's selling them the same thing that the enemy sold to Adam and Eve in the garden. So that they all might be condemned who did not believe the truth. Back to the text. I'm going to stop for just a second. We have ten minutes left. We could go forward just an inch in this passage. So one more little thing, but is there any questions at all on that? You say, we went through that so fast, and there was one thing stuck in my mind, kind of confused me. Anything at all? Yes, grab that mic, turn it on, and go for it. Leave it up, and you're good. All right. Yep. Okay. Um, I, I guess my question is is what we were kind of talking about where God ends up hardening the heart. Is that like the unforgivable sin that Jesus mentioned? Meaning like the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Absolutely it is. Okay. When you look at the Scriptures, there's about two or three hundred different ways to phrase the unpardonable sin, as some have called it. It is the doctrine laid out in Romans chapter 1 and 2. It is laid out in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's laid out in one encapsulated statement that Jesus made to the Pharisees. Those that blaspheme the Spirit have no forgiveness, neither in this life nor in the life to come. Now, he's not saying that the Pharisees just cursed the Holy Spirit out. They did no such thing. They simply rejected him. And if you go on and on and on and on and on, rejecting the truth, refusing to believe the truth, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, this is the result. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh-huh. Mama O, what you got? Just straight up and you're good to go. Yep. So um, when you said that even now some people are already hardened, I like that I don't understand. Mm-hmm. Let me turn and read to you um, and we will, we will stop there just for today. But let me turn and read to you from Romans. Turn uh, real quickly and we'll, we'll close it out there. I want to answer your question from the Scripture. Romans chapter 1. The simple answer is if God has hardened somebody's heart to this point, to this point, there's no hope. That's the simple answer, okay? But here's what's important to remember. Neither you, nor I, nor anyone else on the planet know when a person is in that condition. God has not put that burden on us. And there are some who believe that we do. They're very wrong. They claim in the name of having a gift of discernment that they know that this person... Uh, I don't believe that. Okay? Now, the reason why there are some who believe that they are able to know, uh, it is based on Scripture. It's because of passages like the book of Jude and Second Peter 
where the language goes along these lines. For whom is reserved the blackness of darkness? Where Jude will actually say that they were created to be destroyed like brute beast. So whereas Jude talks about a kind of people, okay, you have people today who think they can take that theology that those kind of people that are hardened and they are deceivers and they are going to be eternally condemned they take from that that well and we can kind of perceive who who they are that's not true god hasn't put that burden on us if he had here's what here's what we'd be doing we we would be doing what hyper calvinism does okay hyper calvinism Calvinism is, is not bad. Hyper-Calvinism, when it's overextended into something that, if you know anything about Calvinism, John Calvin never taught anyways, is an idea that, hey, you know what? Some people were created to be destroyed, so some babies are going to hell, and why should I go witness? Because if they're elect, God's ultimately going to bring them anyway, and if I happen to be in the Red Lobster when they do... I'll tell them about Jesus, and boom, there it happened, and I got to be involved, but there's no urgency, and it's also something that in the mindset of someone who has a hyper extension of that, looks and thinks, you know what, we don't even mess with people that are doing these things, saying these things, because they're eternally condemned. So there's people who think that, but it isn't scripture. Because the scripture only tells us that, yes, there are people like that, but not that, and we know who they are. We can spot them. In fact, it says the exact opposite. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13, and giving us the parable of the wheat and the tares, you leave those tares alone. Leave them rooted right in with the wheat in the middle of the church, because if you go in and you try to uproot them, you're going to be messing the wheat up too. That's what he says. Basically what he's saying is, uh-uh, that one ain't your job. So you don't need to know, you don't know, because you got no responsibility there. Your job is, he gives us another parable, that of the sower. Sow it everywhere. So why would Jesus, he's the son of man who goes and sows his seed, Right? Why would he let some fall by the wayside? He's God, where the birds are going to pluck it up. Why would he let others fall on hard ground? Because he sows it everywhere. So we take the example of our master, and we don't hold it back from anybody. But I just want to give you the verse real quick, and then we'll close out our time. Right on time, too. Praise God. Uh, so Romans chapter 1 and we'll just pick up a few verses right at uh, verse 18. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now why, Paul, is it being revealed or poured out? Verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them for since creation the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. And he will continue to go through this passage, which you guys, if you want, can read for homework. And he will talk about how, in spite of this knowledge, that they corrupted themselves, they chose to reject him and to live their own way. And in verse 24, he says, Therefore, or this is why, God also gave them up to the same things he just described, uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Same language as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Again, he says it, verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchange, and he just goes into a list of sins uh, you know, uh, uh, particular sins that's very lengthy, kind of all the way down uh, through the rest of the chapter. 
And in verse 32 says, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, they understood that there was a judgment for this deep in their hearts, but they kept suppressing it. Who knowing, verse 32, the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do them, but approve of those who practice them. So the idea of God giving them over to do these things is that of taking his hands off. Who are they? We don't know. Do they exist? Absolutely, they do. Uh, the Apostle Paul, the one exception to what I said is the Apostle Paul in some places in the New Testament letters does make direct uh, reference by name to people. But here's the way that I, I look at that. Because the doctrine of Scripture like the parable of the wheat and tares. I talked about it over and against the parable of the sower. Sowing it all over. Hey, you don't mess with this, trying to distinguish and pull up tares, right? Because of the overall doctrine of the Scripture, I think when we see the Apostle Paul naming certain individuals as people that are reprobate, because he does name some of them. Guys like Alexander the coppersmith type characters. I think what you see is the office of apostle that I do say clearly is not with us today. We have apostles today just like they did then. They're right here. Paul is my apostle. Peter's my apostle. Those are our apostles. But apostles in the sense of people that were given the task with miraculous power to authenticate the gospel as the message of God on the backs of miracles like raising the dead, that office isn't with us today. It's not. And that's something that's actually really easily demonstrable in the Scripture. However, the office of the apostle in the sense of foundational works, missional works, going and founding works, that is with us. But there is a very different office that Paul occupied that Peter and the others occupied, and there were only 12. It's why in Acts chapter 1, Peter said, hey, we've got to pick one guy. He had two. He said, we've got to pick one guy to take Judas's place. Why? Ain't but 12 spots. That's why Revelation chapter 21 and 22, it says, and the names of the 12 apostles were written in the foundations and in the gates. So other apostles in the sense of a different type of um, foundational missional work, yes. But in, in the sense of, hey, who's going to write the next book of the Bible? Not with us. So they do have a special office and with that came special revelation. The doctrine of the Bible is sealed. If you get anyone who shows up and say, hey, I just wrote 3 Timothy today, no, that's, that's not good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, there is so much of it that is difficult to understand. And Lord, I, I know that your word says that we prophesy in part. That now we see through a glass darkly. That then, Lord, that we'll see clearly. That we'll know even as we're known. So... Lord, I don't want to preach my opinions. I, I want to be faithful to your word. Help me to continue to do that. And if in anything I'm off, I pray that you would uh, help me to see that. Correct me, Lord, because I do just want to give your people, Lord, what you have preserved to be given to them. So make your word live in their hearts. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would animate it, make it alive inside of them, that it would feed and nourish them through this week, that they would be encouraged Lord, that you are coming again. And while we have an immensely great job to share your gospel, to warn people, that we also do have the assurance of our salvation, that we are not appointed to the wrath of God, but to obtain salvation through your Son. We praise you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen.